welcome to Hot News. We are live on Pan African Television. We are also live on Facebook at Pan African Television, on YouTube at Pan African Television, as well as 48 African countries. We're joining the conversation by sending in your views, comments, and contributions on our WhatsApp to text line. We'll make a tag and read all those out for you. You can as well leave your suggestions. Sorry, you can as well leave your suggestions, questions, and whatnot on our social media pages on Facebook, Instagram, and on Twitter at Pan African Television. I also read all those out for you. Those of you watching us on Facebook can share the Facebook Live for other people to also watch tonight's edition of the program. All you need to do is to like our page, you know, subscribe to our page on Facebook, on YouTube, and you get the notification of all our programs and all of that. Tonight on Hot News, we are looking at the Supreme Court's decision on uh, the matter of a deputy speaker voting on the floor of Parliament. You know that a private legal practitioner went to the Supreme Court for interpretation of Article 102 and 104 of the 1992 Constitution. We are talking about forming a quorum in Parliament, uh, which was dealt with under Article 102, as well as you know voting on the floor of Parliament under Article 104. The Supreme Court judges, by their reasoning, you know, think that by denying a deputy speaker uh, the right to vote in Parliament amounts to disenfranchising his constituents, the people he is representing in Parliament. They've also thought that there hasn't been any, you know, article in the Constitution that has expressly provided for that the deputy speaker shouldn't vote in parliament basically that's what we are going to be looking at but both minority and majority in parliament have had you know their fair opinions on the ruling coming from the supreme court let's listen to the deputy majority leader honorable Fenio markins on the matter i'll be back to introduce my guests for the discussion for tonight in 2015 the supreme court of ghana delivered a landmark decision in the Kojogra Adra case against Pani Lamte and the Attorney General. I was the lawyer for Kojogra Adra. In fact, the contention of the then minority was that those who were holding public office and were also vying for positions in the NDC amounted to a breach of Article 943B of the Constitution. We argued this in the public space. When it didn't find favor, we went to the Supreme Court. What was the contention of Kojoga? His contention was to the effect that, to the extent that Article 943B had listed certain category of public servant for the avoidance of doubt, let me read aloud 943B. <clears throat> they have listed a member of the police service, prison service, the armed forces, the judicial service, the legal service, the civil service, the audit service, the parliamentary service, the statistical service, the fire service, the customs excise and preventive service the immigration service, or the internal revenue service, or C, is a chief. 943B prohibited all these people as not being eligible to be members of parliament. And if you read, just suppose that against Article 58, they could also not hold party office. So our contention was that Ghana Highway Authority officials, GES officials who were contesting for NDC party officials by par uh, party positions, by parity of reasoning, they should also be prohibited because they all came under the public service category, i.e., you can't be working with Ghana Education Service, then hold a party card and be a regional chairman, but if you are with Ministry of Education, the law will say you are prohibited. So that was our argument. But the Supreme Court was clear. On the 15th of July, delivered the decision, 7-0, the Supreme Court was unanimous. 
What did the Supreme Court say? All that the Supreme Court told us was that, look, to the extent that the framers of the Constitution did not include them, they could not add them. They were restricted to those who have been prohibited in today's case. In fact, Dr. Ayeni, the, de the then Deputy Attorney General, opposed me in court. His view was that if the Constitution had intended to include GES staff, Ghana Health Service staff, Ghana Highway Authority staff, it would have said so. We accepted the decision. We didn't scandalize the court. And the party members were happy to contest for position. That is how come officials from Ghana Highway Authority could contest. speaker has not been specifically prohibited. But they are arguing that by parity of reasoning, once Mr. Speaker has been prohibited when presiding, they should also not have the right to vote when presiding. Our argument is that going by the reasoning in Kodoga Adra, you cannot approbate and reprobate. You cannot, when you are in government, argue because conveniently it goes for you. But today, you want to say that that decision should change. The Supreme Court has delivered its ruling. How on earth will a minority leader make a statement to the effect that the Supreme Court is attempting or the Supreme Court wants to support the passage of the e levy Wasn't it their own party member who went to court? Or to them, immediately they go to court, they must win at all costs. That is not fair. And we are drawing the attention to the fact that if they continue to break down the institutions of democracy, one day they will come back to cross the bridge and there will be no bridge to cross back home. The NDC is destroying everything needed to sustain good governance. And that is not how to operate a democracy. Extremist attacks cannot be the way to go. Argue forcefully when you lose, graciously accept it. And that is what we did in, when we were in minority. We didn't go out to attack the Supreme Court when we lost in the Kojoga Adra case. Welcome back. So that was the Deputy Majority Leader in person of Honorable Afinio Markins. You're still watching Hot News Radio on Pan-African Television with me, Justice Apia. Those of you watching us on Facebook can share the Facebook Live for other people to also watch tonight's edition of the program. I've been joined in the studio by Honorable uh, Dr. Dixon Adumaku. He's a, he's a member of parliament for Anya Sotum. We are also expecting a member of parliament for Bosa North constituency in person of Honorable James Agaga in the studio. As and when he joins us, he'll be part of the discussion. But you've listened to what the uh, deputy majority leader, uh, who doubles as a lawyer, has said on, on the matter. Now, let's go to Honorable uh, on the issue of, uh, you know, this ruling. You know, you had a scuffle, you had, uh, you know, a brawl in Parliament over this issue because the, uh, the Deputy Speaker of Parliament wanted to, to vote at the time. He wanted the second deputy to change him so that he, would, he was going to, you know, have the opportunity to vote. But the minority actually prevented it, which led to a private legal practitioner going to the Supreme Court for interpretation on Article 102 and 104. Your opponents, the minority in Parliament, thinks that this is a travesty of parliamentary justice. What are you saying about that? Hmm. Well, uh, thank you, Justice, for this opportunity. Hmm. Uh, uh, since I'm the only one here, I'll try and be as, <laughs> uh, you know, clear about my, my stance and my opinion and the uh, opinion of the majority. Uh, let me start off by making this very clear. I, I think uh, the Eighth Parliament is, is a very different ball game from all the experiences that many of our forefathers have had, uh, in the sense that 
two critical things have happened. Uh, first of all, uh, having an executive or a president in power who's a speaker of parliament is from a different ideology. Right. That is one big key uh, thing that is unusual. And then in addition to that, I mean, and, and, and hear me out, the speaker can be as fair as possible and as balanced as possible, but there's an inherent ideological difference which has been in existence for several decades because the speaker has been in uh, parliament for a long time. Right. And he had been with one ideology, which is the uh, National Democratic uh, Congress yeah. ideology. And it's imbibed in him. He's drank the water. He's eaten the Kool-Aid uh, food and everything, NDC, for several years. <clears throat> for NDC for a long time. So, so the key thing here, is, I'm not saying that the speaker is biased, right. but the key thing is that that was his ideology. Be it a socialist ideology, that was his ideology. Right. Uh, where you have the MPP, which is largely, um, uh, let me say, uh, in a way progressive in nature, uh, business oriented in nature, more so uh, than the NDC. And, and, and those ideologies are clear and crystal clear. So we, we have that one big issue where President is the MPP and the Speaker, the third most let me say, powerful person in the country, in the sense that when the president and the vice president are not there, he's the acting president. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so that, that is one huge thing. And then second, we have this 137, 137 on both sides with one deciding factor. And uh, that is also another unusual scenario. So the eighth parliament is, is not an easy one. We have these two critical... Uh, unimaginable things happening together, not in separate terms of office, but together. And I really think that at the beginning of all of this, we should have maybe sat down and tweaked our operational uh, ways maybe a little bit and, and come to terms with how the ball will be played in Parliament. And we, we, we sort of missed that ball because... Uh, the Seventh Parliament standing orders is what we're using. Be that as may, uh, another key thing is that when I got elected as a member of Parliament, December of 2020, I couldn't carry myself as the MP. I was MP-elect until I was sworn in on the 7th of January by the Speaker. And that is when... I became, uh, you know, the member of parliament for my constituency, which is Ajaya Sotum. Now, in addition to all of this, let's bear in mind that uh, the speaker of parliament, when we had voted for him, needed the Supreme Court, uh, the, the Chief Justice, to empower him, to give him that authorization to act as the speaker and what I'm trying to drive at is the fact that none of the three corridors of power the executive parliamentary or legislative or the justices are on their own right. we work together so as it stands the chief justice empowered the uh, speaker to be the speaker of, of parliament and then the speaker in turn uh, decided, uh, you know, for us, swore, swore us in as parliamentarians officially. Right. And then that is when our vestige or our authorization to be members of parliament started. And then likewise, the speaker authorized the president. Even when he had been re-elected, he couldn't carry himself in the eighth uh, parliament as the president. And, and what I'm trying to say here is that the overall document of the land, that keeps us all together, keeps us going, is the Constitution. Right. And the, the body mandated by law to do interpretation of uh, you know, the, the Constitution is not, is not Parliament, neither is it the Executive. It is the Supreme Court Justice. And, and 
I think that more and more uh, we may be confused in Parliament, but out of the confusion, somebody submitted our work to a separate body, a separate entity. Well, we are equal but not necessarily equal because our functions are all different. Mm. And when it comes to interpretation of the Constitution, I need to be very clear. That lies in the bosom of the Supreme Court, not in, in the legislative. And like I said, the overall power, uh, you know, is in, the, is in the Constitution. And that, they have been mandated. Nobody can ask Parliament to interpret the Constitution. Right. Nobody. So let's be very clear about these things. Now, one very other interesting thing. Listen, um, we need to mirror things most of the time. And, and I've said this in many places, and some have misunderstood me. In the committee level, and Justice, hear me out. Right. At the committee level, a chairman does not vote unless there's a tie. You understand? And it is, you know, that is almost like an original thought that the framers of this constitution had that, listen, at the committee, select committee, be it health, be it finance, be it whatever, when there's a tie, the chairman should vote to make it very what, clear so that that becomes a deciding vote for the committee. Now, history has a funny way of you know, reminding us of some things. I think that by whatever rudimentary thinking that led to that decision that when there's a tie, or so, so I mean a tie, let me put it right, when there's a tie, the chairman of the committee or the presiding authority of the committee should what? Vote to break that. Now, should in case we don't have the speaker in parliament, what are we left with? We have 137, 137. Right. And if we are mirroring or in legal parlance, you know, parity of thinking or of processes, if at our select committee level, when there's a tie, invariably the presiding authority can vote, what then prevents us from agreeing to the fact that a presiding authority in the chamber should vote? Now, that is one argument. Okay. The other argument, which is a no-brainer, if you are a member of parliament and you become a minister, do you relinquish all your powers? Do you relinquish all your rights because you become a minister? Or if by virtue of uh, the work we do, you become another person? And in this case, I would love to ask the minority leader Honorable Haruna Idrisu, when he became minority leader, did he then lose his power and authority to vote in the chamber? He hasn't. But being a minority leader is different from being a deputy. It is an additional. Which has been provided for in your I'm, I'm, I'm making my argument. Right. So that's an additional pos position, mm. right? Because, you know, I've had my good friends make arguments that once you take on a bigger role mm. then and you're enjoying all the you know lages and things surrounding that bigger role then you are forsaking your rights I, I i can bet you my last coin that the majority and minority leadership rank you know very high in terms of parliamentary work and and i i almost would love to say mm. and don't get me wrong that the deputy speakers if i was doing an organizational chat, I'll put the deputy, the two deputy speakers with the majority and minority leadership. I see how. If, if you understand what I'm saying. In I, terms I of, understand it. But in terms of, mm. you know, now, the other interesting thing is Is it in terms of the role they play? Or, I mean, the, in what the, sense? Let me say the role they play. Okay. You know, in terms of, and the way they can make things happen in parliament. Mm. You understand? Now, the other very uh, interesting thing, which I need to be very clear here, is that we are in a situation where 
when you have the 137, 137, invariably then no business can move on if, should in case, the speaker decides to absent himself. I mean, for very, mm. you know, uh, good reasons. So, so my, my key thing here is that, one, uh, when you read some of our standing orders in terms of the article, uh, let me go to like 109, 2 and 3. Right. And, and, and these are the very interesting things. That my small knowledge of law, in 2, it states categorically that the speaker, okay, cannot have both the original, original and the casting. Yeah. And then it goes to 1093. Hmm. And 3 states that the presiding person, and mind you, any member of parliament in the absence of all those three can be called to uh, preside. Mm. Uh, presiding over a meeting, uh, you know, you should be qualified to do that once you're a member of parliament in the absence or in an unforeseeable situation mm. where the speaker and his two speakers of parliament, deputy speakers, are not there. Mm. Now, my assumption of the role of presiding, I mean, uh, the Americans do it so nicely. Uh, Nancy Pelosi presides and still votes. I mean, that's one system you mm. can you can say, "Hey, big deal." It's it's American, fine. Now, in the Australian scenario, MPs who are speakers vote. You understand, okay. and it makes sense. I mm. mean, it makes absolute sense. They are counted and voted. Um, so here in Ghana. With our current scenario, which I've explained that we are in a situation where things are unusual. And, and beyond that, when you go to the voting per se, speaker, you don't have an original vote because you're not a member of parliament, and then you don't have a casting vote because mm -hmm. you're not a member of parliament. Okay. But then, deputy speaker or any member of parliament presiding, the state do not have only know, an original, but you have a, you have what? It's, it's assumed that you have a casting. If you didn't have the okay. two, it would have stated it categorically. Before we come to the provisions in the constitution, yeah. what has been the practice in parliament all this while for the past now, know, uh, 30 years? Let that me say. is the most beautiful question you've asked. Mm. Listen, in the last uh, parliament, the seventh parliament, mm. it didn't matter if a, speak, a deputy speaker voted or not. Why do I say that? The votes were so huge. The gap. But at, one, the, six, at, nine. at that time, if a deputy speaker if was if, presiding, if, was if, he voting? If a deputy speaker was presiding, mm. and hear me out, mm. and let's say the vote difference between the yeas and the noes are four, mm. <laughs> or to become one, it doesn't change anything. Has there so, been a time so there's in never the been of our, in, in the history never, of parliament this, that we had deputy speakers voting on a floor? This question... Mm. This, the need for a deputy to vote mm. has never been there, case okay. in point, mm. because that gap was always like, I mean, four votes, ten votes. In the last parliament, it was 169109 or so. Mm. I mean, yeah. And, and looking at that gap, if at any point in time the gap is 50 mm. and you are confused and you say that the speaker should vote, it will be ridiculous because... The, speaker, the deputy speaker voting will, will not add to much because of the gap. But here's a scenario where there's a one-vote decider. Uh, what we are saying as a majority will still hold in any parliament mm. moving forward. So you have, you have in your standing orders, mm -hmm. under, um, is it section 1093? Yeah. Which states explicitly mm -hmm. that... A deputy speaker, whilst presiding, shall not have a casting or original vote. No, no, so it, and that's what I'm saying, that it states clearly that you don't have an original vote, but not, it doesn't add the casting. Mm. But for the speaker, it was very clear that you don't have both the original and the casting. So why is it that and, something and in your terms, orders has provided for, I mean, the it has, deputy speaker would want to, uh, you know, go... Uh, no, 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 he is not going you know. in contrast, mm. and let me, let me be very clear mm. again here, that it so happens that now, one vote is a decider, when the speaker is not in power. But, but your standing orders have provided for that. 
Which, 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 how, how has it provided? That a deputy speaker was presiding shall not have an original vote. An original vote. I, I will, and that, that, is, that is fine by me. Mm -hmm. However, we're talking about a casting vote. And, and my point I was trying to make earlier, which I, I thought mm. you should have appreciated, is the fact that at the committee level, when there's a split, mm. what happens? It argues, and the framers of the standing orders and mm. the constitution made it so clear for us that when there's a split, the appropriate thing to do is to allow the person presiding to what? To vote. And, and, and this is, you know, if we should do anything, the most basic thing is that we should replicate what historically has been the case when there's a split. And the only scenario for us where it is clear in all parties' mind is that when there's a split, the presiding person should vote. I, I'm sure you, you might have probably seen that video circulating mm -hmm. during the time in Parliament where... He was prevented from voting. He said at, at one I point was there. It's that not, categorically it, that he was very much aware that whilst presiding as a deputy speaker, you can't vote. No, he, he said, said that it. he doesn't have an original vote. But then, in even his scenario, mm. where one deputy has voted and he is doing what? Allowing him to come take over proceedings mm. so that he also can go and cast his vote. And I don't see... Why that was, I mean, so he was really even enacting what in his mind, per his understanding, that if he was seated, and I am actually going further to tell you that, mm. listen, in simple terms, you see, uh, when, when the two sides don't agree, we ask you, what was the normal state of affairs? Right. And the normal state of affairs in parliament, and, and hear me out, at the committee level, the mm. instructions are that when there's a split, the presiding authority should vote. How then did we agree to that? How then was it agreed upon mm. that when there's a split, the presiding officer should vote? And mm. we're in a scenario where now, your standing we've orders, never been there. Your standing mm -hmm. orders has never provided for in it that when there's a split on the floor of parliament, a deputy speaker should vote. No. Has that been provided uh, for? We've never been there. But what I'm saying is that if we're replicating what we are doing in the, uh, 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 what do you call it, in the committee level, which mm. is an agreed upon way of state of play mm. when you say the state of play that when you do this it is red card when you do this it is yellow card you understand mm. these are the state of plays and what i'm saying is that when we went to quote unquote a small a smaller uh, uh, session mm. or a smaller number where at the uh, committee level you're not 275 mm. you are less than that and the argument has been made strongly in our you know standing order that when there's a split let the presiding person what, vote. And no. I think that we should just replicate that and also come to that terms that the Supreme Court is, is, has been now very clear to us that, listen, uh, the Deputy Speaker of Parliament at any point in time should not be deprived of their right to vote. Now let's come to the articles in contention, mm -hmm. one, two, 102 and 104, but I'll start with 101. Okay. 101 says the Speaker shall preside in Parliament at all sittings, and in his absence, a deputy speaker shall preside. Mm -hmm. When you come to 102, it says, A quorum mm -hmm. of parliament, apart from the person presiding, shall be one third of all the members of parliament. Apart from the person presiding. So, forming a quorum has actually excluded the speaker or even the deputy speakers. Because it could be a deputy speaker presiding at whatever time. And forming a quorum, mm. such a person who might have been presiding at that time wouldn't form. Uh, let's let's be also clear. Is, is that true or false? Let's be also clear that there are two quorums that we have in oh. Parliament. Mm. Uh, the first quorum is a quorum to start business, mm. uh, and then the second one is a quorum to make a decision. Okay. Now, um, to start business, the presiding authority may be in outside the chamber, mm. waiting for the clerk to count, to start business. He would not be there. I mean, for him to have as rise, Mr. Speaker, and then as rise, the clerk and his, uh, you know, let me not say cabal, 
that Clark and his team of Clarks should have been very certain that, uh, you know, like any chairman of any meeting, you check, do we have a quorum? Can we start the meeting? You understand? And, and, and fortunately for us, the speaker or the deputy speaker mm. would not be in the chamber asking if we have a quorum. He'll be maybe in the office, and the determination will be made whilst he's in office and dressed up or gowned, now not gowned, which, I mean, is something that I, I'm, I'm, I'm for. You know, you know, if, it's not mm. what you put on that matters. It's what's in the mind, you know, uh, and, and what you say that matters. So, so the speaker or which the of the quorums mm -hmm. is the constitution referring to? Well, the quorum to start business is, That's what is, the ones is, 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 is what is what the uh, speaker will not be in to because you'll be out mm. waiting for that to be established before you come in because you have to come in with a maze. Mm. You understand? So so that is one thing. And then when it comes to making a decision for the nation, it has to be two thirds or more. Okay. You understand? And and two thirds or more so that it is quite clear and crystal clear to the nation that the deciders were not deprived or or it, it so happens that the minority is also mm. part of the decision. If not, then it will be almost a one-sided thing. Right. And, so, and, and, mm. and, and in our scenario, uh, that is why we made one argument in, in, in November that when the Speaker of Parliament is seated, their Speaker, which is Alan Bagpin, mm. Honorable Wright Alan Bagpin, is seated, and there are 137 members in the chamber, they can carry on with business, but they cannot make what a decision. Vera, so I'm coming to the reason why and, and I'm that is a fact. quoting the articles. And that is a fact. Okay, very well. Mm -hmm. So, 102. Mm -hmm. 102 says, A quorum of parliament, apart from the person presiding, could be anyone, shall be one-third of all the members of parliament. Now, if you come to Article 104, Mm -hmm. 104 says, except as otherwise provided in this constitution, mm -hmm. matters in parliament shall be determined by the votes of the majority of members present and voting, with at least half of all the members of parliament mm -hmm. present. Present and, and voting. Then, and, and, and article 104 clause 2 says, the speaker shall have neither an original no casting vote. Their speaker. Their speaker. Now not the, the deputy right. speaker. Now the question is and not why, a member. why would Article one zero two mm -hmm. or why would the framers of a constitution at Article one zero two exclude the person presiding which could be a deputy speaker from forming a quorum but would allow them to vote when a decision is let, let, let's, the, let's be clear. The of let's be clear. Mm. The quorum to start business mm. will not necessarily lead you to making a decision. The quorum to start business uh, is literally to get going whilst others come to join. But where you have a critical decision to make, mm. uh, because, because invariably, listen, if the presiding authority is counted and even added to the quorum to start business, and that, that, that decides you know, to be able to start business, then you don't have a real full house. There's a deficiency. Mm. So, so I, I think that we need to be mindful of the fact that to get business started, oh, let's open up and let's start work. You need a minimum of one third. Mm. If you can't meet that one third, then definitely uh, you're not you, helping You need a house. minimum of one third, which the, speak, the speaker or the person, no, not the, the person presiding. It is, it, is tip, it, is to, it is to tip us towards making sure that more people are available for business to start. That is what, that, that is the, you know, every legal thing, there's an intention. Mm. There's, there's what we call nudging in economics. Nudging means that you set the rules in such that people behave in a certain way. And if you are setting the rules for parliamentarians to be in the chamber to get business going, you want to tip it to a, a point where more people will be encouraged to come in the chamber. Why would anyone say, that under Article 104, Clause 2, mm -hmm. the speaker as referred to is uh, right, you know, retired Honorable Abam mm -hmm. but not any of the deputy speakers. When in at any time when the speaker himself 
isn't available. Mm -hmm. The persons who step in, I'm talking about the deputy speakers, whoever steps are you, in, are you is aware? Are all the responsibilities, you know, not as all, a speaker. Not all. Speaker, let me let me be very addressed as a speaker. That's number <laughs> one. The maze. Those you know, are those are actually uh, to uh, their seats. They have a different place. They decide who speak on no, the floor no, of no, parliament no. Listen, and who you know does what on the floor of parliament at what time. I think we've been mm. we've been bad with our dictum. Okay. And that is what has led us to this. Right. It is very appropriate to address anybody in that seat besides the speaker as it oh Mr. Deputy Speaker. The Brits do it. They say, Mr. Deputy Speaker, they do that. Mm. It is just that by convention, we've come to, you know, be calling, it's, it's, it's almost like mistaking the Vice President for the President. That's what, we, we cannot do that. You cannot mistake in the Vice President for the President. And tell me that when the President is gone, the Vice President has all the, uh, you know, accoutrements. Can the Vice President change the Cabinet overnight? He dare not. You dare not ask the Deputy Speaker to change the board for Parliament because the Speaker of Parliament has travelled. So that in absentia, when the Speaker of Parliament comes back, he'll come back to a reinstituted board. Wouldn't that be interesting? So mm. that at any point in time, when you tell me about rights of the Speaker, tell me that the Deputy Speakers can go about making those changes in Parliament and it would hold water. It won't hold water. There are levels at which we've seen a when you are speaker, acting, even an we've acting seen CEO, a deputy speaker mm -hmm. change a decision made by the speaker. What did I say? There are decisions and there are decisions. And and what I mean very clearly here, and I'm telling you that you you allow vice president to run this country when the president is away mm. and make an attempt of changing cabinet, you'd be surprised. I mean that is that is like a death sentence. Mm. And no deputy speaker in as much as they are empowered to make certain changes mm. in the, you know, other plenary, they are allowed to make all the necessary changes. I mean, as their authority would afford them. I mean, however, there are limitations to the things that a deputy speaker can do. So don't be misguided at any point in time mm. that, A, the deputy speakers have the same number of quote-unquote maybe security have the same office no 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 please the two are what never saying is that well mm. they have never been against the voting right of a deputy speaker oh really what they are against mm. is a voting right when the said deputy speaker is presiding and i've explained that, that at the committee level when there's a split we agree that the chairman should vote and why are we we, we, should, we should sit down and ask ourselves why Parliament decided that when there's a split, the presiding authority should vote. We should ask ourselves that question. And we'll come to terms with the fact that, listen, the appropriate thing to do in the interest of the country, not in the interest of the MPP, not in the interest of the NDC, is that when there's a split, when there's a tie, the presiding authority should meet, be the decider. So another argument espoused by Honorable... Uh, Al Hassan Sohini yesterday on this platform mm -hmm. is that in Parliament, for instance, if the Deputy Speaker is presiding mm -hmm. and he calls for a vote, a voice vote, mm -hmm. I mean, those in favor should say yeah, yeah. Then they, they say those in those who are not in favor should say no. They also say no, no, and all of that. If there's and, a split, and, and, and somebody calls for a division, a division. Oh. right? It means that. We are calling for a division of persons who have shouted yeah, yeah, and no, no. So those are the people who are going to be counted, not the deputy speaker presiding, sitting over that, that is That is small thinking because mm. at the committee level again, when there's a tie, you know, it, it states categorically that the presiding chairman of the committee does not have an original vote, mm. except what? When there's a tie. So, so when, you are, when you are there, and in your mind, the yeas have it. Mm. It is almost like saying that there's a there's a there's a there's a there's a there's a, a non-original vote. So the yeas you might not say, but when it appears that there's a tie, then what does the constitution or the mm. standing order say? It says that the presiding member should 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 be the decider. And I see no reason why 
we all have at some point agreed that when there's a tie, the presiding authority should vote. And then we, 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 the rules cannot be different, really. Should they be different? But, but, but the, your standing yes. orders has been very clear on that. No, that no, no, at no, the committee no. level, let me, when let me, split, let, but let, it hasn't been clear. Let me remind, let me remind you, like mm. I was saying, that this Thai scenario was not at the peak of our worries ever mm. until the 8th Parliament. And it's been it's one of the <laughs> appropriate tests of our maturity as political engines or as a, as a nation. And, and, and today, I watched in, in tears as I, I realized that uh, steps were being taken by the minority to literally take government aback, mm. to literally uh, deprive the people of Nkranza and other places of very crucial medical needs. And, and it is painful that lives will be lost because of pettiness in parliament. It is painful that services, water, electricity, very basic needs of people are being put on hold because of pettiness. We need to move beyond all of this. And, and you know one thing I don't like is making codes of numbers and things, you know, orders and things, when clearly it is a rule by common sense. Mm. And common sense is what we really need to return to. Mm. Though very expensive, as they say, common sense is not as common. I would beg, and, and, and I think I ought to use this medium to beg, Ghana needs to move forward. We as a nation, NDC is no better than any Ghanaian. MPP is no better than any Ghanaian. Mm. Ghana is what matters. And our concern as parliamentarians, our concern as politicians, should largely always be focused on the betterment of Ghana and our democracy. And, and, and we shouldn't be leaning towards uh, denigrating other people in power. We shouldn't be leaning towards denigrating the, the, the high offices we hold mm. in this country. If legislative members cannot respect the decision of a Supreme Court, uh, ruling, then who do we expect to respect the rulings of parliamentarians? Or in, 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 in the members? reasoning of the Supreme you know? Court, in the reasoning of yeah. the Supreme Court judges, according to them, uh, the Constitution has not expressly provided for that a deputy speaker cannot vote on the floor of parliament when a decision is to be arrived at. The same way the Constitution has not provided for a deputy speaker to vote on the floor of parliament. If you read Article uh, 2952, mm -hmm. that's the interpretation section. This is what it says. In this constitution and in any other law, a, a reference to the holder of an office by the term designating his office shall, unless the context otherwise requires, be construed as including a reference to the person for the time being lawfully acting in or performing the functions of that office. So it means that when you are, you know, when the uh, deputy speaker is in the seat of the of the speaker, justice, performing the speaker's functions, is, at that moment he's seen as the speaker. It is almost like telling me that mm. once you become uh, the speaker or you are deputized as a speaker, then you have a right to, excuse me to say, the speaker's wife. Is that what we're saying? You have a right to his cars. Is that what we're saying? You have a right to his bodyguard. Is that what we are saying? No. Let's be very simple in our thinking here. But this, this is a you know, it's so clear. It's not that so, once it's somebody is acting on your stage, when you are aware the person is a deputy speaker. You, you are not the speaker. That. You are the deputy speaker. And, and like I've told you, you cannot. And, and, and let, me, let me be very clear here. Listen, uh, I, I, I wish to be in the shoes of the Vice President, <laughs> Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, when the President is away, mm. where you are acting as the President. Mm. The word is what? Acting as. There's no way the Vice President, whoever he is, would undo certain critical decisions that the President has taken. 
by virtue of the fact that he's acting as the president, he dare not change finance minister, he dare not change road minister, he dare not change all these ministers that have the blessing if, of the if president. If that's not against the constitution of this country, what's wrong with it? Oh, let's be quite frank with administrative work. If you're an administrator for a company or the CEO of a company and per the virtue of the fact that you've traveled and you have somebody standing in for you and those two weeks when you're gone, by the time you come back, this person has wiped everything you've been doing, all the strategies you've put in place, mm. all the decisions you've made. This person literally wipes it. Is that good for business? But by the Supreme Court ruling, they are saying that once it has not been provided for in the constitution, it, it, it's a right decision. Oh. I mean, so what if... Uh, make, <laughs> making making that decision mm. necessarily doesn't make it right. But let me just rehash this thing. Mm. Ghana is in a very tough situation, whether we like it or not. And uh, what is very clear to me is that having 137 on each side mm. ha hasn't really sunk in for all of us very well. It's been a year plus and right. plus uh, three months, and we are not fully at the level where we can accept, you know, in wholeness, the, the true meaning of 137 mm. on each side. And in wholeness, the beauty of having a Formina MP who is the sole decider, uh, this unimaginable. Mm. And, and let me admit here that even the MPP, uh, as much as we, we, we worked hard to some extent to torment and disengage with Formina, uh, when the die was cast and Formina MP won, it was a huge surprise. And to date, it's still a huge surprise. And, and we've come to terms with the fact that, hey, Charlie, all these perceptions we had has to be debunked, has to be thrown away, and, and make friends anew. And I think that the NDC party and the MPP ruling government uh, should have an, another look at the way forward. We have more than two years left to you know, another major election. And shall we let these two years just go by without doing some monumental developmental things for the country? Uh, need I say that if we don't push for Ghana, whether we win an election in 2024 as NDC or MPP, any delayed developments we major out or to the Ghanaian people will not be good for us. People are doing monumental things in the U.S. and the, in, 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 in U.K. and in Europe. We are here, people on the moon, and we are here doing these things of musical chairs with parliamentary decisions, things that clearly will not really benefit us. And, and, and I'm pained when I look at the gravity of decisions that we ought to be making as parliamentarians. Um, I've, I've, I've watched parliamentary proceedings in many parts of the world. Uh, one of the funniest things uh, that happened recently was this excessive reminder of the need for numbers to be in for business to start. And, and I, I think we ought to mature. Telecommunication allows a lot of us to watch on Facebook, allows a lot of us to even watch in our offices whilst within the premises of parliament. And, and, and I really think that we, we need to come to terms with the fact that technology has somewhat changed the way we do parliamentary work. And, and, and as such, when you will not know. And, and, and maybe we should enhance our technology such that, in fact, you could be sitting where, anywhere in the world and with your fingerprint, which is tied to you, can make your vote. And, and we ought to rise above what we're doing now. I want a day in time when the constituents will say that, ah, we'll vote for Dr. Casey because this man has been voting this way in parliament and has been consistent about making sure that our roads are fixed, has been consistent about making sure that water is reaching people in all parts of the country, has been consistent about making sure that hospital care or health care 
has been brought to people's doorstep. Right. This is what we should be about. Not uh, she say, he say, and this pettiness. Oh, well, you know? To, uh, yes. Ruling, what they are trying to say is that um, before a deputy speaker was an MP, a member of parliament, mm -hmm. so before, uh, let's say, Oromo uh, Joseph Usu became a deputy speaker, yeah. was a member of parliament. Yeah. And that if you deny him of his vote, that would amount to disenfranchising his constituents. True or false? I think that that's what the Supreme Court was trying to say. Well, but apart from that, it is, it is one of the arguments they made. Apart from not that, just the only one. The Supreme Court is trying to say that because it has not been expressly provided for in the Constitution that a deputy speaker cannot vote on the floor of parliament, I mean, they, they are unable to rule against that the question is he has also not been provided for in the constitution that a deputy a deputy speaker can vote on the floor of parliament has that been provided for and parliament by article 110 mm. you know you have the right to make your own rules especially when the constitution has not provided for you don't have, you have a right a rule. you don't have a right to make rules that are not in tandem and you have made the constitution a rule. okay so the, the rule at 1093 that says a deputy speaker cannot vote, cannot have an original, Very well. so cannot but have it an leaves out which, which a custom vote. Which constitutional provision has that contradicted? Well, as you know, uh, there's what we call implication. Um, you, you can't, you know, there's that one funny thing you can't make an omelette without breaking the egg, hmm. okay? So, so it, invariably, when you're going to Let's say you're reading, you're making egg, uh, making an omelette, mm. and it, it, it says two eggs, uh, onions, blah, 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 blah. And you are sitting there waiting for the instructions to say that, break the egg. That, that would be like a real joke. Mm. You understand that? You, you, you're waiting for the instructions to tell you. The only way you can have an egg fried is that you break it. But, but, and, oh. and, and if the instructions do not tell you that, Break the egg and you sit this there. Is, this then is we are in a blessing, huge this mess. This is a blessing given to Parliament by yeah. the Constitution at Article 110, mm. Clause 1. It says, subject to the provisions of this Constitution, Parliament may, by standing orders, regulate its own procedure. Yes, but and you can't regulate it to the Parliament, detriment of the Constitution. And Parliament, at your in your standing orders, mm -hmm. at I think Rule 1093, stated that. A, a deputy speaker was presiding shall no, not a have deputy speaker or a presiding member or fine shall not have an original vote original but it doesn't which, it doesn't which, say which it didn't has, say an original vote but and a which constitutional vote. provision has that Hello? has that contradicted justice are you aware that the uh -huh. supreme court has struck out that you know uh, provision yeah because it's it is it is uh, you know in 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 the essence of it it doesn't say anything in the essence it doesn't mm. and and that is the whole point that uh why say break the egg when you know in essence you ought to break the egg to make an omelet that should should somebody tell you uh you know it's almost like two couples who don't know how to as it is mate mm. to make babies uh and 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 they're sitting there trying to figure it out mm. If you don't mate, you can't make the babies. And 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 in simple terms, uh, if if you sit there and wait for somebody to add no casting, then you're making a mistake. If it was needed, they would have added it there that the deputy speaker and the person presiding, any member of parliament presiding, will not have those two. But it leaves it out. Your colleagues are the man uh, on the minority side. My good friends on the minority. Your very good friends, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> are saying that the Supreme Court ruling is a judicial support for the approval of the E level. Another what ridiculous thing. That? Another ridiculous thing. I mean, listen, we are trying to set the game for whatever decision we have in the future, mm. and and we need to be clear in our mind that regardless of the E levy, any other decision that comes to the floor. And it so happens that the Speaker of Parliament is not present. Mm. And we have this tie. The presiding person should cast their vote. And, and it, it is, for me, 
I'm thinking like my elderly people and my old woman, that what happened in that scenario, I, and, and listen, it reminds me of the story in the Bible where, you know, the, 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 the judge had to decide, or the king had to decide on who to give the woman's child mm. to. And he, he tossed the question out there, and, and through the questioning and the answering, he realized who ought to have the child. Mm. And, and as it stands, wisdom should be used uh, in making decisions for our people. And in the wisdom of the framers of the Constitution, or even in the framers of the standing orders, made it so clear in our standing orders that at the committee level, when there's a tie, the presiding authority should vote. And I've said countless, countless times that, listen, this whole question about a deputy or a presiding member voting has only come about because we're in a scenario where we don't have four votes difference. If we had four votes difference, or five, or six, or seven, or eight, it how would not how, how matter. Do you, how do you refer to a deputy speaker whilst presiding? Listen, we have every right to say, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Now, why, don't, why don't you say it? It's just, why do you say it, it, it has Mr. been, it, is, it has been out of, let me, for, for lack of a better word, a preferential uh, uh, accolade. But I'm telling you that your but, standing orders has given a blessing to that. It is in your standing orders to refer to a deputy tomorrow, speaker presiding. Tomorrow, because I'm in as, parliament, mm. I have every right to say, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I see. That is what happens in the Brits, uh, Commonwealth, all of the other mm. uh, nations. It just so happens that we are being reverent. When and if you should call him Mr. Deputy Speaker, you have not broken any rules. By implication from the ruling of the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. it means that a colleague member of parliament can refer to uh, uh, a deputy speaker as honorable uh, so-so and so. And that's what we've been saying. Honorable Mr. Speaker, uh, sorry, honorable Mr. Deputy Speaker. What about and you have every right to so proceed? For, for me now, or honorable MP for the fire. It, it's, it, I mean, that would be almost like dropping one title. So you, if you are, wait, 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 let me, let me be frank right. with you. Mm. It will be dropping one title. So you can say that Honorable Deputy Speaker of Parliament, also MP for Bekwai, or MP for Swami, or MP for Fomena. Mm. If you want to say all that, and then even add all the uh, committees they chair as well, fine. Nobody stops you from that. But the point is that, listen, um, the vice president and even his wife, mm. the president and his wife, we give them that his excellency, her excellency. Mm. Don't we do that? We do. And, and it is just appropriate mm. that we do the same for the deputy speakers of parliament. Right. And, and let me be very frank with you. Uh, the American system I adore the most. Mm. Don't we say Nancy Pelosi? Have you seen her cry about? Oh. What's this about these, uh, you know, accolades and titles? Anyways, mm. it just so happens that our culture is drawn towards appellations in this country. Right. Nana, Ohine, that is Ghanaian, mm -hmm. and and we always afford people the respect they deserve. And and when you are deputy speaker, and you want to be called Mr. Speaker, that's your choosing. If someday I'm God bless me with Deputy Speaker of Parliament. Very well. And, and they call me Mr. Yeah. Deputy Speaker. Yeah. Ah, we'll have any I won't have any issues with that. Right. The work will still go on. Right. And in as much as they sit in that chair, they don't have 120% everything that the Speaker okay. is able no, to finally, do. Finally, before we go, mm -hmm. I mean, our time is up. Uh, unfortunately, Honorable Gaga couldn't join us. I don't know what, what prevented him. But then, um, your very good friend, Honorable Al Hassan Suhini, was here yesterday. Once again. Okay. He described the Supreme Court judges, or the ruling as a partisan ruling. Partisan ruling. You know that before that, the <laughs> Member of Parliament for Medina has also cautioned um, judges who are being political and partisan, and that if you are a judge in you know, that attitude, then you are going to be treated as a politician. Looking um, at these statements and all of that, people are making about the, the judiciary, or the Supreme Court judges, or even our judges in itself, uh, what listen, do you think of it? Listen, when you lose a case in, mm. in court, 
you have to carry yourself well. But the minority uh, didn't go to court. We, no, I mean, let me make a, 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 mm. an argument that uh, Nanado Danko Kufado was there in 2012. Right. The present then opposition leader. Right. <laughs> in fact, had it bad. It was a painful experience for all supporters, all of us who worked hard. Mm. Uh, 2012 was a huge blow. Some people died out of frustration and heart attack. Right. Uh, some people vented out by going on the street, mm. looting and things like that. True. Uh, did that make it right? No. But I'm, I always hold our president dear to mm. my heart because of that one thing he said. Right. That he's not happy with the verdict, admittedly, but since the Supreme Court justice has ruled, he will, uh, you know, take it in, mm. in good faith. And, and that is what... I think that the NDC should do. Very well. and, and this is not a partisan decision. Mm. We've, we've been on the other side before, which I think Honorable Afinio Markins made it clear that at some point in time, we were trying to extrapolate and say that, oh, uh, once we said civil servants, we were, at, we were trying to add more categories. And the Supreme Court said, no, it doesn't extend. So by extension, if you are trying to extend what the Speaker of Parliament has or his limitations, to the two deputy speakers, the question is, the answer is no, because they are members of parliament and they are deputy speakers of parliament, and as such, not just non-MP speaker of parliament, right. members of parliament, and maybe in the future, we ought to either two things, let a, 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 an MP be speaker, or we choose not to do that. We, we have, that option is available. It's been done in other jurisdictions. I mentioned one place. I think uh, Australia is one, and some other other places, which are you know part of uh, you know the, you know parliamentary proceedings. And and I think that it is in the interest of Ghana now, as it stands, mm. uh, that because if not, then listen carefully. Every government business, in the absence of the Speaker of Parliament, necessarily will become a lost. Uh, bill, and will that be in our interest? You you bring it back, it gets lost. You bring it back, it gets lost. Why not then just allow the speaker to decide? And right. and and as it's done at the committee level, when there's a tie, and when you are seated, uh, you know there's one three seven here, one three seven here. It is a tie, so the deciding factor becomes what the presiding authority, and this has been the setup. And it is what makes sense, logically. And let's use logic. Once that logic works at the lower courts, which is the committee level, taking it to the higher courts, I mean, nobody would say no to that. Unless, right. of course, you are a non-developmental, non-progressive agent who has come to make uh, governance difficult, governance uh, at a standstill right. when the rest of the world is having issues. Justice, God bless our homeland, Ghana, Thank and you, make sir. us great and strong. Thank you so much. Your Thank final you very words much. To My final words. words. I mean, especially um, the um, Many people have wished mm. me in their homes. Right. It is not easy. Mm. Uh, plenty of people say, oh, doc, don't go to TV and come to my house. But I have a duty to serve so many people. Right. And, and I would beg them, when I can, I'll come to your home. But at least this affords me to be in multiple homes right. at one time. Mm. So as we've come to visit you through television in your homes, do forgive me at an opportune time uh, as I'm indivisible mm. and can't multiply myself in all these homes over the 300,000 homes in my constituency. Right. I'll beg them uh, once in a while, let me use this medium to at least address matters of high importance to the nation so that my job would affect many more lives than just one or two individuals. Right. Thank you so I much. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for coming. We are so grateful for your time. We Mucho gracias. The good work, uh, you are doing in the constitution. Mucho gracias. Uh, since you, you, you took over, I mean, a lot of, you know, testimonies. We're, we're doing our small best. I wish we've I could do more. We've been there on several occasions. We've listened. We've seen your good works. And we only plead with the people of Anyasu to maintain you. So all works in the constituency. 
you know, are done. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for coming. We are so grateful for your time. It's maintain 2024. Maintain 2024. 2024. Honorable Doctor. That's the agenda. We are setting it today. Uh, maintain 2024. Maintain 2024. Yes. You know, Sarkodie says it's difficult to maintain. So, uh, uh, as much as Sarkodie <laughs> says it's difficult to maintain, yeah. but Honorable, we will you, try you have to maintain and, I mean, 2024. If, if there's anything you want yeah. me to do for you in the constituency too, I'm available. Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming. This is time we'll last. Make a time with that same time tomorrow. My name is Chester Pia and the show has been hosted. Goodbye. Thank you very much. <laughs>